Hi, everyone. My name is Catherine Accurso, and I'm happy to be welcoming you to the final session of the first ever SPLIG virtual conference. For this last session of the conference, we have a fantastic panel putting together a talk on the topic today of contributions of SFL to discussions of gender and sexuality in Latin America. And they'll be discussing connections between social semiotics, decoloniality, queer feminist studies, and intersectionality. And so our chair for this session is one of the presenters themselves. I'll introduce to you now Fabio Becerra, who holds a doctorate in English and Applied Linguistics and a PhD in Linguistics, and has a lot to say on these important topics. Uh, right now, he's an associate professor in the Department of Modern Foreign Languages at Universidad Federal de Paraiba in Brazil where he leads um, a research group in systemic functional linguistics, critical discourse analysis, multimodality and multiliteracies, and has a research project titled Decolonial and Intersectional Perspectives for Contemporary Applied Linguistics, Multiliteracies, Identities, and Teacher Education, which I can't wait to hear more about. So without further ado, over to you, Fabio. Thank you so much, Catherine. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizing committee for allowing us to have this opportunity to share some of our work with you, um, with this international audience. So it's, it's a great pleasure for us to be here. I'll, for now, in the very beginning, I'm going to uh, also introduce the other three presenters very briefly, and then I'll do the first presentation, okay? Um, just after, after my presentation, we have uh, Professor Carmi Rosa Caldas Cotard. She has a PhD in English from the University of Birmingham, UK, and undertook a postdoctoral research at the University of Strathclyde and at the University of Birmingham, UK. She's a senior uh, research fellow from the Center of English Language Research at the University of Birmingham, UK, where she worked from 96 to 2012. She was professor of English and Applied Linguistics at the Federal University of Santa Catarina in Brazil, where she has taught for many years. She works in the areas of social semiotics, gender studies, multimodality, and forensic linguistics. She has published widely, both nationally uh, in Brazil and abroad. Uh, after that presentation, we are going to have um, the work by Herman Canale, he holds a PhD in second language acquisition from the uh, Carnegie Mellon University. He is associate professor at the University of Linguistics um, in uh, Uruguay, Montevideo. His research interests include critical discourse analysis, multimodal social semiotics, multimodality, and ethnography, educational media, and textbook studies and language policies in education. He has recently published a book. Technology, Multimodality, and Learning, Analyzing Meaning Across Skills from uh, Macmillan. He's currently head of the research project Negotiating Gender Identities in the Classroom, funded by the National Research Council. Uh, after Hillman's presentation, we're going uh, to close it off with Deborah's presentation. Deborah de Carvalho Figueiredo holds a degree in law, an MA, and a PhD in Applied Linguistics. She is currently Associate Professor of English at the University of, Federal University of Santa Catarina in Brazil. She has published in journals and books such as Language and Law, uh, Critical Research Studies, Systemic Functional Linguistics, and Critical Research Studies. Um, okay. Her research interests include issues of gender, power, class, and identity in, in media and legal discourses. So this is this was a very brief introduction of this lovely team we have uh, put together today. Um, the, the way we're going to organize this, each of us are going uh, is going to have 20 minutes for the presentation. And after those 20 minutes uh, for each, we are going to have some time for uh, Q&A. OK, so um, I, we hope we all hope you guys write down your questions, your comments, and let's interact as soon as the presentations are uh, done with. So, Deborah, could you share the slides for me now, please? Okay, thank you so much. 
Uh, so let me just make sure I stick to my time so that I use the 20 minutes. Okay, perfect. Um, the name of my talk um, is, let me just organize this slide here, just a little bit. Uh, it's, it's titled Transviada Applied Linguistics. There is a reason I'm using a word in Portuguese, okay? I, I'll be shortly explaining this. Uh, decoloniality in the study of language, gender, sexuality, and their intersections. Next slide, please, Deborah. Uh, this is the way I have organized my uh, talk today. I'll be um, briefly talking about local matrices and then applied linguistics, decoloniality, and intersectionality. Uh, next, uh, I, I have decided to open uh, my talk with a quote by our uh, dear uh, Paulo Freire, and also a quote in my mother tongue. Of course, I'll be translating it to you. The, I, I, I decided to, to write it in Portuguese here because of the word of the verb esperança, that is very particular to the Portuguese language. So. Paulo Freire, in his Pedagogy of Hope, he said that é preciso ter esperança, mas ter esperança do verbo esperançar, porque tem gente que tem esperança do verbo esperar. So he says that it's necessary, uh, we must, uh, we have to have hope for things, instead of, but hope of the verb to hope for, instead of hope of the verb to wait. It's because in Portuguese, we do, we have, uh, the same verb can be used for to hope for and actively doing so, and then only, only the action of waiting. As uh, uh, um, in opposition to English, that you have the word hope and wait, right? So that's I decided to use this because this is a very important concept, especially for the, 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 the pedagogy of multiliteracies I have been working with in the past years. Um, in a decolonial perspective, I believe that it's very important that um, whenever we are in contact with peers, especially from the epistemological north, we um, strive to make sense of those theories and methodologies and praxeologies to understand how can, uh, to what extent they can be useful to our own contexts. So in the context of the research that I have carried out, having hope is quite important. So that's why I decided to start with this quote. And then a quote in English. As an ontological need, hope needs practice in order to become historical concreteness, right? Next. Here, um, just very briefly, the, 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 the project that I, that I developed uh, from, uh, from eight, 2018 up until last year, um, it was a project, the end of, the end of 2020. It was a project designed for teacher education at the Federal University of Paraíba, where I teach and, and research. And basically, this project, um, one of my main goals was to be in contact with classrooms in this university course um, of other professors so that we could find ways of developing a pedagogy of multi literacies in different, in different courses. Um, these practices were strongly influenced by the pedagogy of multi literacy proposed by the New London Group, and more specifically by the revision of that pedagogy of multi literacy uh, put forward by Blue Cope and Merita Lances in 2015. Um, so, this was the organizing concept for the pedagogy of multi literacy, those uh, elements that direct the, the practice of. Um, uh, conceptual, um, ex, uh, conceptualizing and then experiencing, applying, so all of those concepts, and then very strongly the grammar and visual design. That's the, the, the strongest connection, connection with SFL in my research. Next. Uh, overall, the main results from this project, I have this quote here to share with you. Overall results signal the need for teaching and teacher education practices to contribute to broadening worldviews, developing empathetic attitudes, and fostering the commitment to individuals and communities whose subjectivities and bodies are marginalized in our society. Um, it, it became very clear during the project that students had a hard time uh, implementing or designing classes to be taught in public schools here in the city 
uh, where they would be addressing intersectional issues such as gender, sexuality, race, um, and others. So uh, this was one of the greatest challenges, and this came up in the conversations we had, the discussions we had very frequently. Um, even developing this project of multiple interests, going in some of the classes taught at university, um, they were able to put to put that experience into the planning of their lessons, but still, uh, it was very um, infrequent. The, this, um, the, the lesson plans, which decided then after the experience, having the courage of addressing issues of gender, sexuality, and race, ethnicity in the classroom. So it, um, it became very evident that we needed to, I needed to move forward in a way that my participation in those contexts also contributed with um, knowledge and practice in regard to those intersectional matters. Next. Uh, but then I am situated in a lingu language studies in applied linguistics. I be, I'll be shortly explaining to you what I mean by transliada in the first slide. This is, uh, I can already say that it's a translation of queer in, in Brazilian Portuguese, a possibility for that translation. And in this context, I, 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 we have, it's necessary to acknowledge the achievements, the visualizations, but also the invisibilizations of people and issues in the history of applied linguistics in Brazil, and the expansions that have happened so far and are still in need of happening. Next. Uh, here, I just put together the image of what we have, I think, important people in the country that have put forward studies in language studies. Um, addressing language, gender, and sexuality. These are some of the very important names in our country. Uh, two of them are here, uh, my, my dear colleagues, Carmen and Deborah, people who have, um, for many, many years, uh, addressed issues of language and gender, and more recently, sexuality as well. So I, I pay tribute to the people that um, put, have historically contributed to the area of applied linguistics in that matter. But um, using that, being in contact with all that um, production, uh, all that knowledge that has been uh, shared throughout the years, I have also noticed that we need to move forward in some aspects. Next. But this moving forward, in my perspective, needs to happen in a decolonial um, way. Uh, um, so putting together multiliteracies in, in, in dialogue with decoloniality and intersectionality. Uh, decoloniality of knowledges, and here I know I'm using, I'm putting it in the plural on purpose, but it's in subjectivities. Next, you can see an image, uh, uh, not yet. I, I put a, a slide just to make sure that people could understand a little, a little bit what I mean by decoloniality. They refer to studies that uh, aim at unset unsettling theories, methodologies, references, subjectivities, epistemological relations of power, and et cetera, in order to denounce and to overcome structures that create and maintain processes of historical domination, extermination, erasure, and invisibility. According to Bovin Durek Santos, a Portuguese scholar, uh, much so involved in the decolonial studies, um, some of these are patriarchy, capitalism, and colonization. So the issues that I have put that I mentioned to you before that have been um, struggles for the, the, the teachers, um, uh, uh, in-service teachers, I'm sorry, pre-service teachers, um, such as gender, race, ethnicity, uh, many of those issues are strongly and very closely linked to the issues of patriarchy, capitalism, and colonization, right? So uh, the importance of also informing these studies with the colonial perspective has been very um, fruitful. Uh, the next slide shows you uh, a, an image of a lot of people uh, that have contributed so far to epistemologies and voices of the South. Uh, many, some of those um, work currently in the US, 
but they are originally from different countries in Latin America. So we have here just a, uh, some of them with issues such as systemic um, racism, sexism, coloniality of power, of being, of, of knowing, border thinking, the idea of, then we have some Brazilian um, um, researchers such as Sueli Carneiro, Beatriz Nascimento, Lélia Gonzalez, who are um, very important in our country for under understanding, especially of the oppressions that have been caused by colonialism in our country and the enslavement of people that have been kidnapped from the African countries, right? Next slide. Um, and then I come to the point of talking to you about um, the word transiado uh, or transiata, depending if, it, if it's in, in alignment with um, the, the masculine or the feminine. Um, the decision to, to use the word transiado in, in, in my research, and even here in, in, in a present, international presentation, which I'm, I'm speaking in English, is because when I see the way that I, I interact with um, the, the theoretical and epistemological contributions of queer theory, from, especially from the US uh, and some countries in Europe, Spain, for example, and England, uh, the way that I see the work that needs to be done in Brazil is not, is not exactly um, that, because the queer theory has been developed in those localities, in response to the needs of those places. So I think it's very important that we also understand how this theory travels to the South. And in this traveling, the word transviado has a strong um, um, semiotic power and, and it's very potent in our language to represent people in issues that have been seen historically as dissident, as, de as deviating from the norm. So I think it's a, it's a much more um, powerful and, and useful term when we are speaking in Portuguese. So I decided to use it here in English as well to mean that I'm not referring exactly to queer studies. I'm referring to how queer studies have been received here in the epistemological South. Um, next. And finally, we have the topic of intersectionality. Next slide, uh, it, which is, <clears throat> You can put to the next slide, Deborah. Thank you. Uh, intersectionality, um, as I mentioned to you, decoloniality before, this traveling of the theory and how we can understand identities and experience that, that, that deviate from the norm, the expected norm, um, not only in Brazil, but elsewhere. Um, this was my focus moving forward in, in project because of the need that I, that I have already shared with you from the students, the, the, the very high difficulty that they experienced um, dealing with these issues. So I thought it would be very important that these issues are dealt, be dealt with in respect to our own um, context, our own history, colonial, patriarchal, and capitalist history in Brazil. Um, in that respect, intersectionality, <clears throat> There is this researcher here in Brazil, uh, uh, Caterina Rea. She's actually Italian, but she works in university here in Brazil. She said, uh, we need to pay attention to the travels and transit of queer theory to the global south and its political and epistemological effects. Um, and then she mentions queer theory of color in which uh, issues of racism, immigration, imperialism, neoliberalism, xenophobia, homonationalism, homonormativity, all of those issues are in very close connection with our local histories. So it is an understanding of queer theory, of um, gender and sexual identities that deviate from the norm, this norm that is imposed, obviously, uh, that it's necessary to include this, uh, this center so that the center is not there anymore. It's a, a very hard struggle, but I think it's it's an important way for us to to to, to go um, in addressing issues of gender and sexuality in Brazil by putting together in much closer, much closely, much more closely connected contributions of queer theory in 
in, in connection with the knowledges that have been produced in Latin America and more specifically in our country, especially by people of color. Right. Next slide. So Transviada Applied Linguistics in conclusion, I have the final slide, the next one where I have the sum of the proposal, which is a proposal that I'm still developed, I've been writing about. Uh, it's a proposal uh, for uh, Transviados studies, uh, which have to do with the rejection of binarisms and essentialisms and intersectional articulation. So we cannot understand gender and sexuality in isolation from race, ethnicity, and social class, especially in countries that have been historically oppressed by the colonizing um, processes, such as Brazil. Um, this um, um, idea is um, in, in connection with uh, language studies, to unsettle the theories and the methodologies that have been informed before me language studies so far, much more specifically in our country, with decoloniality, as I already mentioned, so that we can um, unsettle and question and create different life dialogues and tensions be uh, uh, between uh, epistemologies and, and, and bodies and subjectivities and collectivities, right? Um, but this, I have, I have found that, that it's very important because it's, it's, an, it's in the very birth of queer theory. And this is a strong contribution that I think should all be carried out when going through uh, this traveling to the South, which is the idea of um, social sciences. Um, that we, the idea of developing language studies should be also in connection with social, social studies, right? Uh, so I come to the end now. Next slide. Here are some references that I can sh share with you later on. Next slide. Um, thank you so much for that. Uh, if you have questions, here is my email. And, uh, and here you can follow my research group on Instagram if you'd like. You're much welcome to do so. So thank you. Thank you very much. Deborah, you may stop sharing now, please. Okay, so um, just to, or, to organize our ideas, we have started the, 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 the talks at 740. So I still finished here five minutes before to give you guys more time, right? But each of you is meant to have now 20 minutes for your talks. So in the sequence, we have now Carmen. So Carmen, um, you may start sharing your slides and start your presentation. Thank you so much. Just a second. Okay, is it on? Can you see my slides? Yes, it's on. Yeah. Go okay. Ahead. So let me just diminish. Okay, good evening, good afternoon, good morning. I'm not sure. Um, it's a big pleasure to be here with all of you. Uh, thanks very much for the organizers of the conference, um, which has been a success so far. And thank you, um, Fabio, for initiating uh, our meeting, our presentation, in fact. Let me just start my time here. Um, so it's a great pleasure to be here and hello to everybody. Um, my talk today is about discourses of ageism. Oops, mm -mm. no, I cannot. Uh, what's happening to my slides? No. Mm -mm -mm. Ay, 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 ay. What's the problem here? I can't. Oh. <laughs> can I start again? Oh, dear. You can yes, use your. Sure. It's not. Bottom left, there, the arrow. No, it's not changing. Yeah, uh, do you see arrows at the bottom left? Yes, 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 yes. Okay, so okay, you can okay. use them, yes. Okay. There you go. Right, here we go. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about ageism today to you, which is stereotyping and or discrimination against individuals or groups on the basis of their age. And in fact, uh, Fabio, Ageism should be in your 
slide of intersectionality. <laughs> because ageism is not talked so much as it should be. So I hope to talk a little bit to you about this terrible, uh, terrible, terrible social practice. For me, ageism is a combination of connected elements. It's discriminatory practice against older people. It is institutional practices and policies that perpetuate stereotypes about elderly people. Semiotic regimes, as we all know, are the ways in which semiotic practices are regulated in specific context. contexts. And ageism is a semiotic regime materialized in all kinds of social practices. In fact, in most of them. As a semiotic regime, ageism is expressed in many conflicting discourses, in formal and informal interactions, in urban spaces, in the media, in beauty brand communication, in personal narratives where people express their different views on getting on or criticize people because they are getting on. Two things are very important to think about, that aging is politicized, aging is politicized, like gender, sexism, ethnicity, racism, etc. But ageism is institutionalized, unlike gender, sexism, et ethnicity, and racism, because we have in institutions policies that demonstrate ages in all kinds of realms of cultural life. The vast majority of public discourses that refer to middle age and old people tend to support and perpetuate the culturally constructed assumptions that aging is a decline story and has strong negative associations. They also tend to legitimate contemporary biases against older people women especially, and this is my focus. And this is done through different style, uh, lifestyle discourses, procedural and persuasive discourses. If we look at our urban space, and we talked about this quite a long time ago, we are surrounded by discourses of exclusion and, ex and, and discrimination. Just look at these figures here. Opa, I go, I go back. We have old people representing, represented in crossing the road. Look at the way they are represented. They have very interesting um, uh, props, uh, like um, walking sticks, their bodies bent, their clothes are very interesting because look at this clothes here. This woman has very long, long dress. What about the bun on her head? Can you imagine us wearing this kind of hair? But the very interesting one is this watering can here. I'm getting quite old now, and I tell you, I never used a watering can in my life. So these are assumptions that old people uh, uh, use, represent, are look, are look. so they are quite interesting. And they are everywhere. So the stages of life are deeply embedded in Western culture in, in spatial metaphors. When enters into adolescence or one enter uh, into old age, we get out of adolescence, but we don't get out of old age, we die. So that's quite a problem, isn't it? So entrances as a structure and spatial metaphor generates a specific psychological orientation to aging that includes negative set of emotions like regret, sense of loss, of time passing, and of life coming to an end. I'm going to talk a little bit about the research because this research that I've been developing for quite a long time is part of a larger multi-stranded investigation into discussions of aging. As we have only 20 minutes, I can only give you some snippets of it. And I developed this with my colleague in Birmingham, Rosen Moon, through the lenses of social semiotics and feminist theory. And the investigation, or we wanted to ask questions about how old people are talked about, how they are represented, how they are classified in public discourses. 
And for us, the aging body is represented in ambivalent discourses, negative most of the time, positive sometimes through evaluations and appraisals. In post-feminist times, ageist and sexist ideologies are powerfully yet overtly present and normalized in most public discourses, as I mentioned before. And the immediate consequence of this is prominence to youth and its values. These are naturalized and deeply, deeply embedded in practices of exclusion and discrimination. Just look at this text here, in their prime. I'm just going to read the, the, the headline. When is a woman at her best? When do her looks, love, life, family, and career all come together? The answer, the answer we have decided is 38. So the voice of seeming authorial authority lays down the norm. It's official. A woman's prime is 38. And I, I imagine a man's prime is 38 too. So perhaps some of you are not in your prime anymore. <laughs> this reflects the deeply embedded notion of life as naturally divided into a linear sequence of ages and stages. And as you can see, life stages are socially and culturally, culturally constructed. The methodologies that we used for this big research were lexical analysis. We used corpus data a lot. We did a lot of, tech, of textual analysis. We looked at media data, and we also did visual analysis. So this was a, a three-strand kind of methodological approach. And I'm just going to give you some examples of each one of these strands very quickly. When we were looking at corpora, we were interested in the question of age and aging by inspecting collocates of specific words. So we looked a lot at words and we focused on adjective usage and labeling. And we applied uh, Telvin Levin's schema for identifying social actors. And this was based on a paper that we published some time ago called Curvy, Hunky and Kinky. And we based this research on a sub corpora of the Bank of English, which was developed at the University of Birmingham, and the British National Corpus. And I'm going to give you just some examples that we found that are quite interesting. When we look at old age, these are the words that we found that report to old age. Disappeared, loneliness, negative in the loss of strength, experience vulnerability in old age. Lots and lots of negative evaluation. We looked at a certain age. After a certain age, now, in terms of uh, the entrance theory, where is a certain age? The look is bleak if you get to a certain age, if you are lucky to. Um, she was of a certain age, so maybe her painting days were over, and this very important one. That's something you find after a certain age, people stop photographing you. Did you know that? Or it's a pretty foggy vision. So quite bleak, as you can see. We looked at evaluations and appraisals in the media, and we, we looked at lots and lots of texts, and we found precious instances of discrimination and exclusion. So things like, you know you're getting on when people call you young looking instead of young. When people say to you, oh, you are very young looking. So that means you are old. So some examples. Gun will be 70 in December. And the laugh is in good. Oh, you cannot see. The laugh is in good repair. Therefore, he doesn't have teeth. Lean and earring is useful both in appearance and in attitude. So as you can see, lots and lots of um, um, ambiguous and uh, problematic uh, statements. The disturbingly youth-looking former personal trial advisor. Timothy, a disgustingly young-looking 15. So the young-looking, although it's positive evaluation, is really evaluating the person very negatively. Uh, some more, some interesting ones. Madonna looks amazing at 49. So she's amazing, but she's 49, so she's old. Or you are 40, you don't look it. Your legs are over 21 year old. 
And then the very negative ones, you are like a 60 year old bitch. So if you are a bitch because you are 60, she does not look like a granny. If you are a granny, it's a problem. Frailty is the big, big, big theme, isn't it? And the discourse complexes that we found are unbelievable because there is a thematic of frailty and decline vulnerability, disempowerment running through the whole of the text that we looked at. Thematic of undeserving old, thematic of empowerment in older age, positive aging, purposefulness, but not very much so. Social judgments and aesthetic appreciations that we looked at, uh, again, the same kind of pattern. Uh, how good women look for their age or how stupid they look for trying not to look their age. So these are the kinds of statements that we find or just how old they are, implication of inability and uh, incapacity. And we found lots of words. We just, I'm just uh, listed here for you, the amount of words just beginning with D uh, that are all basically negative evaluation, disappearing, degendering, desexualization, disability, disempowerment. So quite bleak, very, very bleak. Uh, when famous people are represented in the press, you also have this ambiguous discourse. So you have things like still strutting their stuff at 64. Can you imagine still doing it? You are 64 and you can do it. Imagine, this is really problematic. Or very famous people, uh, the elderly but face feisty Aunt Jeannie, elderly but fit, old but sexy, it cannot be sexy if you are old, um, or still fit and full of enthusiasm. She looked very good for her age. She's 90 now and wonderful for her age. So ambiguous again. You look at this beautiful face and you have aging, Hollywood temperance, Sharon taste, negative evaluation. Lots and lots of discriminations and in the, in the text that we looked at. Looks like a skeletal, skeletal transvestite, ghastly. She's 50, can she, has, can she have long hair? No, you are old, you cannot have long hair. And this one I love, wrinkled and bunion, 43 year old feet in that wearing a mini skirt at such a decrepit, decrepit age oozes desperation. Symbolism of smell, I don't know if you ever associated old age and smells. And this is one of the things that Tilvan Levin talks a lot about, even the smell has meaning. And smell for old people is bad smell. So when grannies are referred to, they are referred as stinking of cabbage, of rotten cabbage, or granny piss fingers. So this is quite, it shocked me when I realized this connection of old smell and old, a, a bad smell and old age. Now, very quickly, I'm going to talk about the Brazilian women, very, very quickly. Um, Brazilian women, um, especially middle-aged white women, don't want to get old. And if you look at this picture here, you have women from 20, 30, 50, 60, they all look the same. That is a saying that Brazilian women don't die, don't age, they die, because Brazilian women don't grow white hair. Some of them, Deborah does not. Um, plastic surgery, yeah, is a must in Brazil. And in fact, plastic, Brazil is the first country in the world for the number of plastic surgeries, a big industry. This is our myth. This is the way women should look in Brazil. White, blue eyes, beautiful, young. And this is a, uh, people want to aim to that thing. Therefore, plastic surgery. And you have, you can do plastic surgery in all parts of your body. Uh, just look at this. Every bit of your body, apart from your toes, you can change and become younger. However, this is war and there is a lot of suffering involved and you find lexes of suffering, scars, cuts, swelling, pain, recovery, and the uh, lexes of war because you have to have do, it is a tragedy, it's an arsenal, it is discipline, and deformed bodies, sequels, sequels, etc. So ambiguous discourses again. So a duality at the heart of the media discourse about aging and resisting aging. Women are damned if they do and damned if they don't transform their bodies. 
So this is the result of 75 years of plastic surgery, a very famous Brazilian um, media figure, quite scary, in fact. Carmen, we can't hear you. Something happened. In yeah. out, you're, you're, okay. Yes. No? Okay now. Okay. okay now. So I find this wonderful photograph of Ernestine Shepherd, who is a bodybuilder at 80. So that is some hope, I suppose, that things are going to, to, to improve a bit. And there are lots of resisting voices too. And I found Isabel Diaz, a Brazilian writer, who says, I don't want to be called an old woman. I am a 60 year, year adult, old adult. I'm not a mature woman of the third age. No, I refuse to be called old, which I think is wonderful. And there are also in, pub, in the public, uh, in the urban spaces, some, I think some new voices, some new representations. Just look at these. Now here, we have again prop, but you have an old person supposedly skating, or two men, two men, not a man and a woman, dancing. And I found this in the bus stop in Birmingham. Oops. And I thought, oops, and I, I thought this was very interesting oh, because, uh, because. You have a figure here, although that is a prop of the uh, walking stick, you, this figure is almost neuter, isn't, she? isn't it? You don't know if it's a man or a woman, there are no markers of age. So just to conclude, aging is socially inconvenient. Solutions are morally indefensible, but solutions are political justifiable. And that's what I think we should uh, fight for. Um, so I think we have to end with this happy woman of a certain age and hope that discrimination and exclusion can be fight, can be fought against, and people are aware that ageism is as problematic as racism and all the other isms in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you too, Carmen, for this lovely presentation. Uh, so now moving uh, forward, we have Herman. You may go ahead. Good. Sure. I'm going to try and share my screen. Um, okay. So can you see my screen now? I should be. Yes, it's, it's all yeah. working. Go ahead. Sure, sir. Good. Thank you. So good evening or good morning, depending where you are now. Um, and thank you for listening to our panel. And thank you to my panel colleagues as well for sharing this moment with me. I will present preliminary findings of an ongoing project uh, about media polemics about gender and sexuality education in Uruguay. In particular, I study the discourse of gender and sexuality guidebooks and how it becomes mediatizing digital news, fueling broader debates over gender and sexuality in society. My aim then is to reflect on the ideological implications of this type of recontextualization of pedagogic discourse into media discourse. My point of departure is Bernstein's reminder that no discourse moves without ideology at play, as you see there in the slide. And so I assume that from the perspective of multimodal critical discourse analysis, it is important to explore how and why a guidebook image becomes recontextualized in the media. I will begin by contextualizing the phenomenon under study, what I am currently doing, during the recent left-wing governments, and thanks to the intensive work of activist groups, legislation started to attend to particular gender and sexuality rights, such as the decriminalization of abortion, the legalization of same-sex marriage and adoption, and the granting of identity rights for transgender people, among other issues. Other actions pertain to education, 
such as designing the National Program of Sexuality Education, which posits gender and sexuality as key topics to be addressed throughout the full schooling process. For this purpose, local textbooks and guidebooks were developed. They were either designed or endorsed by the states. These guidebooks aim at legitimating a new type of official knowledge in the school curriculum by addressing LGBT rights, gender and sexuality identity, and heteronormativity, among other issues. However, following the regional backlash against gender and sexuality, all these guidebooks were met with heavy criticism in the media. They were accused of sexualizing and erotizing children, of putting the heterosexual family at risk, of being pornographic, of confusing children, indoctrinating them into homosexuality, questioning the heterosexual family, filling children with gender ideology, among other things, among other accusations they received. Following Apple and Christian Smith, I take these struggles over sexuality guidebooks as proxies for broader struggles over power, gender, and identity in society. And this is why I believe this is an interest topic for critical analysis. So to explore this issue, I follow media reactions to the release of a teacher guidebook entitled Didactic Proposal for Addressing Sexual Education, my translation for this guidebook. The guidebook was published in 2017 by the National Council of Education. It was developed by an NGO and by a, an educational council, and it was funded by the United Nations Population Fund. The guidebook targets students aged 4 to 12 and was conceived as complementary material for teachers. I will not detail the research design here. You can see that in the slide, and I'm happy to comment on it or, or elaborate on it during the Q&A session. So just to make sure I don't run out of time. My analysis following the mediatization of this guidebook uh, considers three interconnected discursive processes. The mediatization of the guidebook, that is to say the process through which discourse and text from other fields migrate into media discourse. The thematization of the guidebook, the textual, discursive, and editorial processes by which media institutions and social actors turn an event into news or at least into news newsworthy material. And the recontextualization of this guidebook, the process through which meanings, texts, and discourses move from one context to the next by becoming decontextualized and recontextualized. Following Fairclough, to me, this implies a dialectic relation between the older and the new context, between creation and reproduction of meaning, and between colonization and appropriation of discourse. So I will now present some preliminary findings from these three discursive processes. So let me start by commenting on the mediatization process of this guidebook, how this guidebook became polemic in the media. Here is an illustrative timeline of how the guidebook became mediatized. The guideline, uh, the timeline only shows some of the milestones in this process. In particular, I would like to draw attention to the fact that milestones indicated below the timeline in blue are digital opinion texts such as tweets and blog posts. And those in green are opinion mass media texts such as editorials, TV shows, and radio broadcasts. These opinion texts were voiced by different well-known social actors, Catholic leaders, right-wing politicians, anti-gender movements, and a left-wing journalist, among others. The arguments deployed were basically the same arguments used to attack all previous guidebooks, accusing it of promoting homosexuality, erotizing and sexualizing children, or inculcating so-called gender ideology. On the contrary, what you see above the timeline is when digital and print news started to report on this event, which is exactly a week after the release of the guidebook. So this points to the fact that news discourse might not have directly set the agenda for this debate, but instead it followed the agenda of other social actors in other forms of media who voiced their opinions and their negative reactions. 
This fact is informative of the second discursive process I am interested in, which is the thematization of this guidebook in the news. News reports did not thematize the release of the guidebook, but instead the negative reactions to the guidebook. Following Idema, White, and other authors, this type of news can be labeled as issue stories because they are mostly construed around reporting opinions and not reporting events per se. I analyzed 15 of these news reports. I will not show the detailed analysis here, but let me point out three commonalities I found in my corpus. Firstly, negative reactions. I'm using reactions here in a broad sense of the term, not in terms of appraisal. Uh, firstly, negative reactions were reported way more often than positive reactions to the release of the guidebooks. This made the news items more sensationalist and polemic for the audience. Secondly, a wider variety of social actors were brought in to criticize the guidebook, from religious to educational and political figures, showing heterogeneity among critics and criticisms. Thirdly, negative reactions were usually reported by means of direct or semi-direct quotes, which helped to distance the voice of the journalist from the explicit negative evaluations of the guidebooks being reported. As I was analyzing these newspaper articles in detail, I realized that they usually use the same guidebook image again and again. This led me to the third discursive process, which I would like to discuss in more detail, the visual recontextualization of an image from the guidebook, that is to say, recontextualization from pedagogic discourse into the news report, that is to say, into media discourse. So I will start by analyzing the original context of these guidebooks image. The image is a drawing which appears on pedagogical task 11 of the guidebook. I don't know if you can see there. Yes, it's, it's, it's here. The image is a drawing which appears on pedagogical task 11 of the guidebook. The task title is How Are Babies Made? It revolves around the explanation of three stages, fertilization, gestation, and birth. This is illustrated with four images you have there in the slide, which depict different stages for learners to organize them logically and chronologically. The image of the couple engaging in sexual intercourse, the, the final image, was the only one image that became visually recontextualized into the news. To understand why this image was recontextualized and not other, other images, let us consider the visual prosody of the guidebook. The guidebook used several visual resources to interpersonally mitigate potential sexual or erotic meanings. Firstly, all visual representations in the guidebook are drawings or illustrations. There are no actual photographs of human social actors. These drawings are not represented in much detail. Colors are homogeneously used. No detailed degrees of shades, lightning, face expressions, or body expressions are used. Plus, the scenarios are minimally contextualized. However, the image of the nude couple is the only one throughout the full guidebook that shows nude bodies in, nude bodies in an intimate and private affair. The closest degree of affective intimacy in other visual representations is achieved by two boys hugging, two girls holding hands, and a boy and a girl hugging. This makes the image of the nude nude heterosexual couple stand out in a way. However, the image of the nude couple also avoid visual signifiers that could potentially be taken as too sexually or erotically loaded. For instance, bodies are placed in, a, in such a way that the viewer strategically cannot see their genitals as a form of self-censorship. Bodies are represented in such a way that they construe the couple as intimate, they're looking at one another in the eye and they're smiling. They also present the very act of sexual intercourse as a private affair. They are in what seems to be their own bedroom and the curtains are down. And more importantly, the viewer is placed outside the very narrative. There's no eye contact demanded from the audience. To summarize the original context of the pedagogical task, foregrounds the reproductive aspect of sexual intercourse, backgrounding potentially erotic or pornographic meanings. However, since this is the only image that presents such an intimate activity and also nude bodies, it was a good candidate for recontextualization into news discourse 
seen through decontextualization, the image had the potential to become an attention catcher or even sensationalist. So let us now turn, the, turn to the new context of the image in digital news discourse. To do this, I will first explain some of the recurrent patterns in the digital news I analyzed, in which this image is present. First, the image is reproduced without any sort of manipulation. Semiotic resources remain untouched, something that Clark refers to as visually quoting the image. Also, the image is predominant in the digital page. It's a typical attention catcher for, the, for online newspapers. The pedagogic context of the task and the accompanying images are excluded. Usually, there is no caption to explain the image, making meaning connections more loose. It is up to the audience to connect the image to the guidebook. And in the full written reports, there are no elaborations, no mentions, or no explicit references to that specific image. However, it's recontextualized again and again. All these elements contribute to maximally decontextualizing the image because the pedagogic purpose of explaining reproductive stages become erased and to minimally contextualizing it into news narrative because the image is loosely connected to other parts of the news text. In other words, in the original context, the image was explicitly cohesive so as to guide learner semiosis. However, in the news reports, the recontextualized image and its loose connections to the text provide much more open interpretations, multiplying potential meanings. So what is the effect of this type of recontextualization? Drawing on my preliminary findings, and I should uh, say that they are very preliminary, I claim that the recontextualized image serves as a visual attitudinal trigger, using Swite's terminology, because the voice of the journalist does not explicitly evaluate the image, does not explicitly evaluate the reported voices, and does not explicitly connect the image to the reported voices. Instead, the journalist's voice rather leaves the audience to make inferences so as to evaluate the news, the guidebook, and the image by themselves. I will illustrate this with an example from my corpus. To show how the image operates as an attitudinal trigger, I consider text image relations as a continuum ranging from cohesion to tension. Cohesion points to degrees of semantic similarity between image and text in terms of congruency, complementarity, similarity, illustrations, and so forth. And tension points to degrees of oppositeness between image, for instance, in terms of contradiction. Uh, the news reports you have there revolves around a demonstration that was about to take place against the guidebook to request the government to make the guidebook out of circulation and to request pa parents to sign a petition whether they wanted their kids or not to be taught sexual and gender education at schools. If we consider the intermodal relations between the image and the heading, there seems to be a high degree of tension between them, which could be labeled as incongruency between the negative evaluation of indoctrination into homosexuality in the heading and the image showing the heterosexual couple. However, if we consider the relation between the heading and the written report, there seems to be a high degree of cohesion in terms of redundancy in that the written report repeats the same quote from the demonstration, indoctrination into homosexuality, without explaining, illustrating, or elaborating on it. Finally, if we consider the image and the written report, a different type of intermodal cohesion is established. The news, re the news reports the voice of an organized movement criticizing the guidebook who evaluate images by claiming images of the guidebooks are pornographic. The report does not refer specifically to the recontextualized image, but it's the only image that shows and the only image that other reports show. So a loose intermodal connection between the image and the rest of the text is construed, allowing for at least two main ideological readings which imply different attitudinal stances. Some audiences might interpret that the image is indeed pornographic. These audiences are likely to become ideologically aligned with the reported voices who criticize the guidebook. Semiotically, 
This requires assuming there is high intermodal cohesion between the image and the full text. In other words, it requires assuming that the evaluation of pornographic is indeed illustrated by the image. However, other audiences might interpret the image is not pornographic. These audiences will then construe a negative attitude toward the reported voices who criticize the guidebook. Semiotically, this requires assuming there is intermodal tension between the image, the heading, and the full text. In other words, it requires assuming the image is proving critics wrong and the guidebook is not pornographic. In any case, what remains constant is the fact that attitude and evaluation are not explicitly construed, but rather left for the audience to work out by themselves. In turn, by avoiding adopting a particular stance, the voice of journalists is erased, thus securing reading, uh, sorry, securing reader audience solidarity. So my claim here is that the recontextualized image operates as a visual attitudinal trigger because it leaves to the audience much of the ideological and attitudinal work. In so doing, the reader can align with particular axiological communities to interpret reactions against the guidebook as logical, congruent, and valid if they assume the image is indeed pornographic, or to interpret reactions against the guidebook as illogical, off topic, and out of proportion if they assume the image is not pornographic. So this is my, my preliminary interpretations. I'm fully aware that this needs more situated and grounded analysis. So what I'm doing right now is I have complementary data from um, mostly focus group interviews in which I use the image as a trigger. Uh, and also I'm analyzing uh, the comments by users in online journals as well. Um, so, but let us just present some closing remarks for the work done thus far. Visual recontextualization entails a lot of ideological work in moving meanings from one context to the next. In this case, this was done by making a pedagogic image play by the logic of a main image in a news text story. This shift in context was accompanied by heavy decontextualization of the image to erase its pedagogical purposes of explaining conception and reproduction, and by a very loose recontextualization in which the image did not, does not establish clear cut intermodal relations with other textual elements in the news item. In other words, in the new context, intermodal relations were reconfigured. In this vein, the new context of the image allows for polemic and debate because erotic and sexual meanings which were originally backgrounded become somehow foregrounded. Following economo, this is a form of interpersonal intrusion in the news through which the experiential meanings of the original context become backgrounded and the news reports open up new possibilities for adopting an attitudinal stance toward the image, toward the guidebook, or even toward the reported voices who criticize gender and sexuality education. Finally, I believe this is informative of the dialectic tensions in recontextualization between reproduction and creation of new meanings and between colonization and appropriation of discourses, in these cases between pedagogic discourse and between mass media and news discourse. In this case, colonization entails new media turning events, or in this case, reactions to events as new worthy material. So thank you very much. Thank you very much as well, Emma. Um, now we move on to the uh, final presentation by Deborah. So Deborah, can we go ahead and share your slides? Thank you. Perfect to hear, go ahead. Just so you know, we can't hear you, right? Your mic is off. Sorry, Fab. So okay, uh, thank you very much for everyone who is here tonight watching our panel. And I also would like to thank uh, the committee for organizing this event and Fabio for inviting me to participate. 
So uh, my talk uh, is called Gender, Sexuality and Violence in the Discourse of a Brazilian Legal Decision on Rape. Uh, my focus of, my, of interest at the moment is on uh, legal discourse, uh, especially in what concerns um, women's rights from a perspective of feminist studies and critical discourse analysis and systemic functional linguistics. Sorry. Yes. Uh, so in this presentation, I apply uh, conceptual and analytical tools from critical discourse analysis and systemic functional linguistics to invest, investigate and explain from a feminist critical uh, stance representations of gender and sexual violence uh, produced by uh, the Brazilian judicial discourse. From a discursive uh, point of view, concepts like gender, sex, and violence are objects of a constant struggle in legal discourse. To illustrate my arguments tonight, uh, or <laughs> this morning, I don't know, I discuss in, in this presentation how the meanings of uh, violence, uh, of rape, consent, and violence are tensioned and disputed in a Brazilian appellate decision on a rape trial and the consequences of this discursive dispute to the woman victim of sexual violence. In spite, uh, to contextualize uh, the problem, uh, in spite of the frequent debates and alerts about rape culture and about women's rights to control their own bodies, the meaning of consent remains socially and culturally uh, undefined and open to discussion, to contestation, including, as I will show here, in the criminal justice system. Uh, Brazilian courts, they still ground their understandings of consent on patriarchal and heteronormative presuppositions about women's sexuality, such as I will give you some of the examples we find frequently in Brazilian legal discourse. Uh, without the use of force, no woman can be raped. Uh, the damages caused by rape result directly from the use of force and the familiarity or lack of between the perpetrator and the victim. Another uh, presupposition very common is that lack of consent is only relevant when physical force or weapons were used. So I illustrate my arguments with a particular appellate decision on rape produced by the state courts of Rio Grande do Sul in the south of Brazil in 2004. To contextualize the case very briefly, uh, the rape case was originally tried in 2000 by a single judge uh, in uh, Rio Grande do Sul and involved a male worker who, during a work trip, allegedly raped a teenage female worker who was his subordinate. When uh, this case came to trial, the first instance trial judge dismissed the accusation of rape on the grounds of lack of violence or serious threats, which led the public prosecutor to appeal the decision to the state courts asking for the conviction of the defendant. The state court, however, uh, denied the appeal from the public prosecution office and maintained the original sentence, which uh, considered the defendants not guilty of rape. And the examples I'm going to present uh, now are from that um, second degree decision, the appellate decision, where the state court of Rio Grande do Sul denies the appeal and maintains uh, the, that the defendant was not guilty of rape. 
I begin the analysis of this appeal by describing how the two main participants in the trial, the defendants and the victim, are represented following here Van Lieven's framework for the representation of social actors in texts. The defendant is named, we have his full name, we also have an alias. His function lies, he's called um, uh, manufacturing and finishing assistant. He's identified by work relation with the victim. He's called employer, boss, co-worker, someone who held a head position. And he's also classified uh, by his status in the criminal trial. Uh, he's referred to as the defendant and the accused. Similarly, the victim is named. We have her full name. Uh, there are also mentions to her first name. She's identified by work relation with the accused. She's called co-worker or interestingly, she's defined by family relations, the daughter while the assailant is not defined by family relations. And she's also referred or classified via her status in the criminal trial. She's called the victim and the deponent. As to the actions performed by these two central participants in the trial, uh, basically defendant and uh, victim are actors only in some uh, clauses where they are actors in material processes related to this, the event itself, or they are sayers in parts of the appellate decision which recontextualize their versions of the facts through verbal processes. That is, through reporting verbs which project other clauses. However, uh, as in most legal decisions, the judiciary itself, either as an institution or through references to its members or its practitioners is uh, the most frequently mentioned and emphasized agent in the appellate decision. And this is no surprise. As Ehrlich reminds us, appeal courts are clearly more concerned with technicalities and formal aspects of the legal process, which we can call issues of law, than with factual aspects of the experiences lived by victim and defendants, which we can call issues of fact. So issues of fact are much less important than issues of law, particularly in uh, appellate decisions. Appellate decisions, however, they give us access to a variety of recontextualizations of the event or ev events or events under discussion, uh, recontextualizations which were produced along the trial, considering that different legal practitioners may use uh, different presuppositions to base their interpretations of the facts. As we can see in this case, in the opposing positions taken in this trial by the first instance judge, who dismissed the accusation of rape on the grounds of lack of violence or serious threats, and the public prosecution office who appealed to a higher court asking for the defendant's conviction. Nevertheless, even though the um, public prosecution office appealed, the magistrates involved, both the first instance judge and the appeal judges, applied the same interpretive frame to this case, absence of serious threats and absence of utmost resistance, which led both courts to classify the case as consensual sex rather than rape, as we can see in these extracts from uh, the appellate decision. Uh, quote, according to the criminal complaint, the defendant could have performed the rape, uh, would have performed the rape, by using violence or serious threats. As to violence, it did not occur. The defendant herself declared she did not suffer any injury. Concerning the serious threats, as the victim herself revealed, the defendant did not carry any weapon, nor did he declare he would harm her physically. He said if she did not consent to sex, she would end up by losing her job. 
remember that he was her uh, superior hierarchically, right? This does not constitute a serious threat, especially because the victim could very well have resisted the attempt. Given the above, in the absence of violence or serious threats, rape is not considered. Oops. So, yes, in the version of the events presented by the victim and the interpretation produced by the magistrates, we can see a discursive struggle over the meanings of violence, serious threats, and consent with the victory, the victory of uh, the judicial interpretation. The first instance sentence and the appeal decision indicate that in the judicial perspective adopted by these two courts, abuse of power does not constitute violence. Only physical injuries can be taken as evidence of violence. Uh, the threat of economic retaliation, the loss of a job, is not something serious enough. Only the presence of weapons or the promise of physical violence can be characterized as serious. As to consent, even though both courts recognize the abuse of power manifested by the accused, they understand that there was no violence, no major threat involved, therefore, there was no rape. In short, both the first and uh, the appeal courts have applied the utmost resistance standards as the ideological frame to make sense of and evaluate uh, the events and the victim's reaction. This standard is used to depict many rape complainants as women who did not sufficiently resist the perpetrator of the sexual violence, and therefore they are not victims of rape, rather they are women who engaged in consensual sex. In the present uh, case, the complainant declared she gave in to the defendant's wishes for fear of losing her job, a crucial concern for working class people. However, as there was no evidence of what the Brazilian judiciary understands as violence, or major threats, uh, the teenager was represented not as someone acting under coercion, but as an active participant of the events in what Early calls implied consent or consent by conduct, as we can see in the uh, quote here from uh, the appellate decision. The victim could very well have resisted the attempt as there was no violence involved in their view. The fact is that the events took place without the use of violence or serious threats. The promise of losing her job does not constitute a harm capable of inhibiting the complainant's will. To conclude, <clears throat> this appellate decision illustrates how the process of judicial decision making in rape trials tends to ignore uh, that structural inequalities of gender, of race, of class, of age, of position of power, they impact directly the, act, the actions and the reactions of rape victims. In this particular case, uh, what guided the actions of the teenage worker faced with a situation of abuse of power was not the liberal notion of an autonomous subject capable of acting freely, what led her to make the decision that she made was the unequal power relations produced by the age difference. She was close to 15 and the perpetrator was 33. The hierarchical position occupied by the perpetrator, the concrete material conditions in which the events took place, it occurred during a work trip to another city when accused and victim were alone, and the fear of the negative consequences of saying no, losing her job. By not recognizing the material force of the threat against the victim, the judiciary shows how unequal can be the relations between a woman victim of sexual violence and the law with concrete losses to the victim. In this case, uh, her plea was rejected and her abuser was acquitted. 
in addition to the personal loss to the victim, society at large also gets a lesson from this legal decision. The lesson is that there are ways of obtaining non-consensual sex which fall beyond the punitive reach of the judiciary. Summing up, uh, the non-recognition of, uh, of rape in this case results in material injustices against the participants involved and also against women in society as a whole. The trial uh, evidences how social inequalities related to issues of distribution, that is to issues of class, access to material resources, and issues of recognition, issues of identity and subjectivity, they cannot be ontological isolated from one another because they impact directly on one another. The victim in this case is pressured both by the economic or hierarchical differences between her and her assailant, a uh, relation of boss and subordinate, and also by the gender and age difference between them, a 14-year-old female victim and a 33-year-old male abuser. In the criminal justice system, the victim is subjected to another injustice, the non-recognition of the violence that she suffered. And I will finish here because I'm afraid of uh, going over my time. So thank you very much for uh, listening for my presentation. Thank you very much, Deborah. No, you did great fine, so don't worry. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so I have, um, so now it's time for us to interact as much as possible. I see um, here that Catherine um, has shared with us two questions. You can also see them in the chat box. Um, so question one, we have what kinds of resistance and or redirection have you experienced in your efforts to challenge oppressive ideologies? So whoever would like to start, go ahead. As it's not directed to anyone in particular, anyone feel free to answer. Resistance. Can I start then? Yes, sure. Go ahead. It's, it's very quiet. Well, I think by we have to resist by showing, by talking about by making people aware of all the isms that we suffer uh, in the world by education. Uh, I think these are the, um, probably the only resources that we have uh, as linguists. Uh, we don't have access to the media, we have access to education. So I think it's through our teachings, through our talks, through our, um, uh, in the sense, spreading our research, we make people aware. And this is the fight that the feminists raised 40 years ago, language awareness. Uh, now we can talk about visual awareness, about... Uh, um, semiotic awareness of discrimination. Um, but I think by talk, by using our language skills to educate people. That's our form of resistance, isn't it? Thank you, Katni. Um, I'd also like to add something to that, um, Catherine. Thank you for your question. Um, uh, when you mentioned um, cha the challenge of rights and ideologies. Uh, it's quite difficult, right? Especially nowadays in contemporary times, uh, in the context of our country, I mean, we've been experiencing quite a backlash against progressive agendas. And so it's difficult, it's very challenging. But what I cannot, what, what, but also connecting to your other questions, I'm gonna answer both together, you mentioned, when are current sources of hope that sustain you in this work? 
I, 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 it comes to mind the concepts of biopolitics by Foucault and uh, necro politics by uh, the, the the researcher from Cameroon, uh, Ashil Bembe. Uh, so the idea of biopolitics is the idea that the government, the state, controls life and death, right? But this control of life and death um, is much. Uh, uh, it's quite. More, it's rather more uh, complexified when you think of countries such as Brazil and other countries in South Africa, in, in Africa as Cameroon, where the, uh, the author Ashil Bembe is from. He mentions that um, in those contexts, we have to understand that there are challenges to those controls of life and death that are also strongly impacted by our colonial histories. So the challenges that our populations have been facing because of colonial um, uh, um, challenges and enslavement. So in Brazil, 56% of the population is Black. Uh, in two categories that are particular to our country, but 56%. So much of this history is still present today, the effects of coloniality, right? So when we think of that, especially in the experience of pandemic, the pandemic we, we are facing now, um, I just um, got in touch with this new uh, data yesterday. Uh, the number of Black people who have died from COVID in our country is start with, um, higher than um, people of other colors. So the idea that uh, there seems to be a target of some lives are worth protecting while other deaths are toler tolerated, you know, and these deaths that are tolerated usually are of Black, marginalized, queer, um, gay, lesbian, trans people in our country. Uh, and especially in, inter in intersectional terms, Black, um, gay, poor people, for example, Ooh. or Black, lesbian, poor people, disabled. So lots of intersections. And old. And old. And old. And old. Yes. So the, the, the challenges are there. But at the same time, what brings hope for me particularly is the close contact with social activism. I, con I consider myself a social activist as well, not only a professor and a researcher. So in contact with social activism, in my writings, <clears throat> in my postings on social media, I'm also contributing and, and getting in touch with these collectivities, as I mentioned in my presentation. So the challenges are great, but I believe that the power of us coming together to face those challenges are, is even greater. So. That's where it hope is. Um, Can I comment on that? Oh, oh sorry, Raymond. Go, 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 please go ahead. Go ahead, dear. No, I, I was going to uh, complement what uh, Carmen said on the role of education. And as we are all educators here, and some of us are even teacher educators, like Fabio, who works with teacher in, teachers in service and training. Uh, we have a quite a good scope of action, you know, you know, where to to practice resistance, to construct with our students ways of resisting uh, forms of of engaging in in activism. And um, my um, another suggestion is to uh, join uh, any kind of collective or group where your actions can become uh, more powerful, more widespread. Uh, at the moment, for instance, I'm part of a uh, institute within my university called um, Institute for Gender Studies. It is a, uh, an internal part of the university. And because we have been working with gender from different perspectives for many gender sexuality and diversity, uh, for many years, uh, we are frequently invited to participate in um, both uh, municipal and state organizations which produce public policies. So it is a way of uh, expanding the limits of, of university work and actually participating in the production 
of uh, policies for uh, the local uh, municipality or for the state concerning women's rights, uh, sexuality, um, diversity, etc. So this is a way of creating a bridge, let's say, between uh, uh, academic life, academic theorization and investigation, and uh, feeding and working with or producing knowledge with people who are more uh, doing more kind of groundwork who are activists who are members of different councils where we can participate in the production of documents of uh, policies so this is a very interesting form of uh, resisting and uh, participating as uh, members of civil society I, I totally agree. And as Deborah was, was talking, I was thinking that um, the second question that was asked about uh, hope, and now I can't, um, where are current sources of hope that sustain you in this work? And I think that, um, like, that, that vision of like seeing things top down and bottom up at the same time allows us to. to identify issues of power, oppression, and at the same time, identify issues of resistance. And, and that's sort of the ontology of hope as well. Um, I think that oftentimes CDA is criticized for being top down. And I, I, at least to me, that is a misconception about CDA. And there's a lot of work that shows that there's top down and bottom up. And I think there is a need for both things. I think there's still top down uh, power that needs to be addressed as, as the three presentations of my fellow members showed. And I also think there's a need to also uh, uh, make visible, as they were said, like those uh, actions, grassroots actions that attempt to change at least in small scales, some of the, these, these discriminatory or, or unequal relations of, of power. Um, that, that to me is, is key at least to, to, I would like to think local CDA in Uruguay as that type of approach, like embracing both. Um, um, and then as for the first question, I also agree with what was said before. The first question was about what resistances uh, we also found in, in trying to critique such ideologies. Um, at least in, in Uruguay, and I think it's also true to Brazil based on what I've, what I've seen, um, there is this, this shifting thing from, from pro-gender and sexuality rights to, to this horrible backlash against issues of gender and sexuality and LGBTQ aspects in general. Um, and I think it, one of the, one of the, resistances I found is that people tend to believe that when legislation is passed, the problem is over. Like going back to, to like everything is top down. Here in Uruguay, a lot of people would claim that now LGBTQ people are not discriminated, or now women can blah, blah, blah. Like going back to that notion that Deborah was mentioning about the liberal subject that is free to do whatever. And I think still for us, one of the main, main things for local CDA here is to remind us that, that legislation, that there was huge changes in legislation in Uruguay, that's a big step, but that does not secure the social, the everyday social lives of people. And I think that at least in Latin America, I think it's still a huge problem, like being able to problematize what, what this means to our everyday lives. So. I just pipe in to say thank you so much for those responses. Um, and the question comes out of uh, being a junior scholar at a new university who, you know, is trying to begin to engage in critical work in a new location. And from time to time, I find myself surprised by the places that I find resistance or redirection. For example, oh, you want to talk about um, racism or anti-racism? We don't talk about that here. Instead, you need to talk about you know, another of the isms, uh, as Carmen was saying. And so it's very helpful to hear 
uh, the advice of folks who find uh, resistance and do resistance of their own in their spaces. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question. I have actually have a few, but I'm going to ask only one. <laughs> and so that to give you all so room for out asking other questions. Uh, Carmen, uh, in your presentation, I was think I was here thinking to myself because at some point you mentioned that ageism and, and not other um, intersections or, or markers of difference are institutionalized. And so ageism is institutionalized. And then you showed us some signs with as proof, <laughs> real proof of that, that it is institutionalized. There has been some change as you also um, demonstrated. Very slow change. Very few right? though, very few. Yeah, yes. Um, but then my question, I, I, was, when I was provoked by what you said, and I was thinking, if you try to think of um, ways that other markers of difference may have also been institutionalized. And thinking here in Brazil, about Brazil, our context, uh, public materials and uh, official documents, I'm thinking, and even signs, as you showed, I'm thinking, what's the number, for example, of non-heterosexual couples depicted in those materials. So I'm thinking that sexuality is also institutionalized by means of having mostly or all, almost exclusively only heterosexual couples um, as examples of couples, for, ex uh, in, for instance. So I'm thinking that handicap, for example, isn't it institutionalized? Isn't there one specific type of handicap that is usually present in those signs? So um, you provoked me. So I, I got to think in here, aren't there other markers of difference that have also been institutionalized in our country? So maybe if you could say something about that. Yeah, well, what I meant by institutionalized is that ageism or age is a factor that is that concerns institutions like old people can go before younger people to get through the passport or take a bus or in the bank. So that is institutionalized, isn't it? Uh, as it is ageism, I'm talking about age and ageism because uh, in, it, let me give you an example that I heard the other day and I thought, oh my God, we are going through the through a, through a, through a cinema, going, you know, the tickets, the ticket uh, place there. And there was there, there were six people and the man of the family went through the barrier and he said, four people and two seniors. Four people and two seniors. So I thought, what is this? The seniors are not people, right? So in that sense, the linguistic practice reveals institutionalized concerns that old people do not have value, blah, 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 the things that I'm talking about, right? And there are lots of laws in relation to old people, as you know, that we all know. But the, the laws against sexism are still not there, although they're, they're beginning, there are movements, you know, uh, but they are not as powerful as, this, as, as the, 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 the practice of, of ageism or, 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 or age. Um, but this is no, it's research, nobody researched this yet. So we need to do a lot of research. That is, there are lots of research in um, uh, psychology, in sociology, but in our area, there is no research, very little, very little. So we need to do more research. Uh, so the question of, you know, is racism institutionalized? You could say yes, yes, but is institutionalized silently. We don't have 
loss, do we? But we have loss for age. That's what I meant. And generally, they are ageist. Thank you so much, dear, for that. Uh, as I mentioned, I also have other questions, but I'd like to give the floor now to anyone who have, would like to ask a question to any of us. Go ahead. I think people are getting tired. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mommy, uh, I, I, I'm pretending it's not Friday night. Okay, yeah. Carmen. <laughs> Garmi, uh, just uh, something that occurs to me now when you talked about uh, ageism being institutionalized, um, gender is also institutionalized. For instance, you have special discounts for women in some places. Uh, yeah. Or there are some uh, professional... In bars, activities. in bars. In bars, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Or, you, or in, in the case of evacuating some place, women and women children first. would go first. Right? Uh, or you have, for instance, some professions or occupations uh, which are forbidden for women. Right. Legally, right? Yeah, so legally. it, it yeah. also applies to gender in that sense, in some aspects, but not yes. maybe not as, uh, let's say, as spread as ageism concerning right. the elderly. Because yeah. children, it, it, age is also a factor because you have special discounts for children, you have um, things that children, people under 18 are not allowed to do. So age is also a factor for yes, younger age. people. Yeah. I was but talking not about a age. negative. Yeah, but yeah. not negatively. That's but right. Whereas yeah. for older yeah. people, it will be a negative factor. That's right, yeah. So it, yeah, I absolutely agree. I think age is the question here of the institutionalized mm -hmm. because children can do that, adolescents cannot do that, that kind of exactly. thing. And old people, very old people, are placed in the same space as children. As children, exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and for me, the most shocking thing is the devaluation of old people. So Old people, uh, you know, I can give you thousands of examples that in our daily life. For instance, my daughter the other day said to me, um, mommy, mother, mother, perhaps, you have already told me that story. I was absolutely furious. <laughs> I said, you stop it. Don't tell me that. <laughs> I was really furious because the implication Think about the implication. Is that you're that, getting gaga? That, yes. that's exactly, exactly. That's okay. It. And because people don't have patience with other people, and no. this happens all the time, all the time, all the time. So there and, are the implications are so terrifying that you know the implications of no value, invisibility, no value. You know, if you are older, yes. you don't have value anymore. Anymore, exactly. And that is terrifying, terrifying. Um, and this is something that a lot of people do not talk about, do they? No, because, uh, because the, the hegemonic representation now is that being young is the important thing. Is the value, so of course. It, uh, old age is devalued to the point of uh, exclusion from discourse. Exactly. It is, exactly. It is exclusion. Topic. That's what I talk about. Exactly. Exclu discrimination and exclusion. And exclusion. So it's, it's exclusion. not a topic that people uh, discuss no, uh, no, unless no. it is in the sense of how you can hide your age, That's how right. you can look And the other younger. thing that, that I didn't mention, because obviously we didn't have time, humor. Humor is another very interesting um, area to research because humor is associated with old people. Discriminatory, terrible humor uh, that you it, it's, it's, it happens a lot. You know, people make fun of old people. Making fun of old people. Making fun, yes. right? Um, and you don't make fun of young people. And and it no. and it is this terrible, as I said, you know. The values, the values of, of postmodern society are related to 
youth. The youth, yes. And, and you know, uh, 38, 38 is 38, the it's amazing, isn't it? But <laughs> That's coming, after uh, that, it's uh, the you said that maybe a man of 38 would be the prime for males as well. Yeah, it, could, yeah. it, it might be the prime for males, but older guys can get away with much more than we can. Of course, of course. I had lots of examples. I didn't have time to show you. Yes. Lots and lots and of examples of old men, old men and very yes. young women. Yes. And, and again, you know, the, this contrast. And if, think of the other way around. Old women with young men. Younger men. Or yes. I'm not talking about heterosexual couples. I'm talking about any couple. Uh, the difference in age is always a problem, isn't it? But let's yes. stop talking about age because you have other. Yes, <laughs> we have other other questions here. <laughs> thank you so much. It's wonderful to to have you guys talking about this. So thank you very much. There is another question here from Catherine um, directly to me. Um, the question is: Would love to hear more about how you bring your perspective to future candidates you work with. And do you find that it's more challenging to influence changes in features, beliefs, or practices? Um, yeah, not an easy question to answer, <laughs> Catherine. <laughs> much less, so much, so briefly as I have to. But what I can tell you is that um, the challenges are there. Because look, when we are talking about um, reshaping the way we think about knowledge, there is a history, especially in countries such as Brazil, in countries in Latin America, uh, we have been taught certain ways um, to, that we should uh, relate to knowledge in certain ways. So historically, especially knowledge coming from, as I mentioned, the geopolitical north ha has been much privileged and legitimized from the get-go. So there is, there has been no, no, no call for challenging that knowledge, for example, historically. But more, more recently, decoloniality has put forward a conversation in which, okay, is all that knowledge valid the way it, it travels to your regions or not? So thinking of having that to, to, to shift that paradigm of of having that relationship with knowledge, and not only theoretical uh, knowledge, but also methodological knowledge, the ways we do things, it's quite a big challenge. So the first challenge that happens is to create situations in the classroom in which the, the, the in-service teachers, they may experience that there is value in what they have to contribute value in what they have to contribute as far as knowledge goes and as far as methodology goes. So to develop that, re that, that rationality uh, or, or reshaping that rationality, okay, so what we have to say is has its worth. And the ways we have to adapt, um, for example, how to teach English in a classroom, considering the context we, we, we find ourselves in, um, so that, play, that, that position of understanding that it is their job to balance um, what they have contact with from the outside and their own localities. So this is the first challenge. But the more opportunities for practice and reflection we have in the classrooms, the better. Besides that challenge comes another one which is dealing with those issues that I mentioned before. In the three years of the, of the first three years of the project I mentioned, it became very evident that challenges of intersectional um, aspects were uh, quite delicate and they were not their first choices of, of creating lesson plans to teach in their practicum courses to become teachers. So they always let them in the back burn, you know, or, or, or even not consider them. Because it, it is challenging historically, especially in our country where, as Mr. Uh, mentioned in his country's happiness, this backlash against um, actions moving forward, dealing with gender and sexuality in our country, it is very much true as well. Yes. So how do we, how do those young teachers how can they believe they can do it when the institutional um, um, 
organized. Uh, this, this, the institutions say, say otherwise. So it, it is a great challenge, but at the same time, as I mentioned before, the best option has been to bring as close as possible their contact with theory methodology in their localities, their realities, in their communities, so that they can set, they themselves can talk about sexuality and gender and their own issues and challenges with race, for example. So this becomes more empowering and they can believe that they can have a force to go to move forward in their future classrooms, you know? Lovely to see your child. Yeah, we, we, we get a reward here, guys, for our presentations. Hello. <laughs> so. Yeah, thanks, Gil, for condensing oh. that into a short. Yeah. <laughs> hey, who's this beautiful face there? This hello. Oh, you want to wave hello? Hello. <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> Uh, what you also hear on about just the reaction to progressive policy um, resonates a lot with me um, in terms of what's happening in the middle United States where where most of my family and my work originated, but maybe here in Canada as well. <laughs> yeah, I think that there's uh, many countries now that are like having this this backlash in educational terms. It's it's I don't know. Education is always like one of the first fields that suffers any kind That's of right. yes. stabilization of the yeah. of the system. Um, and I have to say this because I got engaged with the age and ageism thing. And I got like two or three things in my mind that I was thinking to, to like examples to mention Carmen as well. I was thinking in terms of Uruguay, for instance, and issues like uh, quota or limits of age for certain careers, BA, MAs, depending what career there are for some for most careers there are no quotas but for some careers depending on your age you can enter the program or not if the program is in is seen as something very very productive <laughs> probably there is or for some things there is an age limit in, in careers then um usually no representation of of the elderly in educational media not at, at least all. for language and for and in language. textbooks Text yeah, books. usually like no representation whatsoever, like some sort of ontological negation. Yes, uh, I wish we could find you. The and um, also a lot of, of policies, like seeing the elderly as, as too expensive for the government. Exactly. Like paying Absolutely. the pension too early, yes. retirement. Yes. Then yes. It, so these are so, all policies, aren't they? These yeah. are all policies. That's what yeah. I meant by institutionalization. Yeah. Yeah. And unfortunately, there's not, those are not only conservative policies sometimes, it's even, no. even progressive yeah. governments have a lot of ageism and age issues. And uh, Germain, also another very interesting topic, this is our research, perhaps our, our research, <laughs> power, age and power, because uh, some professions have to have to reach a certain age and then you have to retire. Others, uh, like ministers or, or presidents or the Pope, the Pope can go on forever. Or the Queen of England, 95. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so this, this has to do with, with power too. Uh, it's quite interesting, isn't it? It's and the university people have to retire at, I don't know, 65. I don't know how. Uh, yeah, indeed, no. very, very uh, true. Yeah, so all these questions, you know, talk about intersectionality. You know, all these things come together. It's power, it's gender, it's uh, race, it's all together. Very, very difficult. But power is a very interesting one. Uh, and as Hedeman said, you know, no representation in textbooks. Uh, in the media, when you have old people, you have negative evaluation as a try to show you whenever that is even a beautiful woman an actress or beautiful man different evaluations from the, the old beautiful man and old beautiful woman. so completely different appraisal realizations yes so, thank you thank you very much um, we still have five minutes left 
Sorry. And, and, yeah, and I just. I, Martina, yes. I, so you go ahead, Martina. I just wanted to mention. Well, thank you for for this um, opportunity. I think that every every presentation was really uh, interesting for me. But I just wanted to mention the one exception. I mean, there might be more, but there's one exception exception to um, representation of age in textbooks in. Uh, series, a local series that was uh, recently published here in Uruguay. And uh, one of the main characters has a uh, grandmother that is, apart from being quite present throughout the series, she is very active. And she's always, uh, you know, like, um, goes with him, they, they go out, they do things together. And, and this grandma is like very, you know, the kind of, um, um, active, friendly, present kind of grandma. Um, so I wasn't really thinking of going, I, I mean, I, I am studying that, that series and I didn't think about, uh, uh, you know, like paying special attention to that character. But now that you've brought it up, I think that uh, it might Martina, be interesting because it's in not that common. Let me tell you, in this book yeah. that was published just last year, there is a chapter on grandmothers that I wrote with Rosamond Moon. And you, you try to read it because although there are some positive evaluations that are terrible representations of grandmother and uh, when they are uh, funny humor, the humor that we mentioned before, uh, they can be uh, transgressive, that can be, that can be criminals, that can be all kinds of things that can be very, very, very enduring like this. Right? Or, let me show you one more. This, is, this one. And this one is from a book. In fact, this was my grandson who drew it. But this, because we couldn't reproduce the real thing, it's a, a book row, uh, written by a very famous uh, English writer. And uh, he has uh, grand. The name of the book is Grand Grand Grandstar Granny. The Granny as a as a um, uh, a criminal, but he he represents this, and it's quite unbelievable because this grandmother has all kinds of things. She smells. She has all kinds of terrible ways of dressing. So. You know, the positive evaluation is very small in terms of the terrible, terrible, terrible construction of being a grandmother. So, but that's an interesting, it would be interesting to see contrastively in terms of cultural norms. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. But I was also thinking that, oh, sorry. No, so it's, I just finished. No, I would I think uh, it, Latin also thinking people, about the hope of the... Yeah. I think Latin people would have a different approach to being a grandmother, okay? But this was done in England. So um, the relations are very, very different from the relations we have here with our grandmothers. Um, okay, guys, um, thank you very much because we still need some time for the organizing committee to um, give their closing remarks. So thank you very much for the lovely presentations, the sharing of uh, the interaction, the questions has been a great pleasure. So thank you very much. So hi, Vin, great to see you. So the floor is yours now, go ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Fabio, for leading the session so well and for all the, uh, to all the uh, panel members for your interesting presentations. They are not my area of expertise, but I really enjoy learning about it because one of my research, uh, recent research projects about languages, I focus on aging, that's my attention. So I really enjoy um, watching and listening to your discussion. So it's a Thank wonderful you. end to the conference. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, I'm happy to offer just a couple final summary comments too of the conference, not this wonderful panel. I'm just so appreciative. Fabio, that you suggested um, this topic and then also pulled together um, such compelling content for it as well. What a thrill to hear this as a final point to four days of very active conferencing. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen for just a moment because I have some 
numbers that tell a story about the conference. And so I just wanted to share those with, with you quickly. A quick reflection on this conference by the numbers. <laughs> so in case uh, you weren't able to dip in across the four days, I just wanted to highlight um, how impressive a program uh, Vin inspired with her idea to gather together a conference in this way. There were uh, 63 live paper presentations, 45 pre-recorded talks, and a workshop across uh, 12 thematic strands. So just really remarkable reach. But also remarkable is the amount of participation that we saw from across the globe. In the last four days, there were 791 people signing into Zoom for different sessions over four days from five continents, much like you across all kinds of time zones. Um, and even from day to day, some people logging in on a Friday, others in the middle of Saturday morning to hear the same talk. And also remarkable is people's engagement with that pre-recorded content. Um, so just even by the beginning of this talk today, there had already been over 2000 views of the work that's posted already uh, on YouTube, on the YouTube conference channel, including folks already accessing the plenaries that took place over the last four days by these um, fine seven, eight scholars, I suppose. We don't have Yegan's picture in this lineup and he gave a talk to Carl. Uh, so I wanted to just offer a thanks in closing, uh, not only to the presenters on this panel, um, but to the whole uh, conference presenters over the last four days and all who attended um, synchronously or asynchronously, we're numbering in the thousands across the globe. And as the presenters today spoke about, there's really something special about uh, collectivity. So uh, just closing with a special thanks uh, to Vin and the team she put together to convene the conference and organize it over these many months. And in the days ahead, we'll be sending um, presentation certificates to all who are involved. And so look out in your inbox for that. And just a thanks again to everyone in this community. And I look forward to seeing how um, we continue to have contact in the months and years ahead. So thank you. Thank you for organizing. Thank much. you very thank much, you very everyone. much, guys. It's a wonderful end to the conference. Thank you so much. Thank and you. look forward to your recording on our YouTube channel and uh, watch our uh, emails from me and Catherine in the future. Thank you very much thank again. You. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.